one over here. <laughs> Hi, I'm talking about the management of distal radius fractures with extension in the metadiaphyseal region. I have nothing to disclose for this talk. The patients that are affected in these type of fractures are the elderly, those with osteoporosis, and young patients. Also, patients that have complications after surgery leading to bone loss or an infection with bone loss. The mechanism for those that are elderly and osteoporotic is a low energy mechanism. And for those that are younger, it's a high energy mechanism, most commonly uh, motorcycle ac accidents, motor vehicle accidents, blast injuries, and industrial injuries. Historically, these fractures were usually treated in a definitive treatment using an external fixator. However, um, external fixator used for de definitive treatment does have a high complication rate. In Weber's study, they noted it had a 61% complication rate. Um, most of these complications were due to pin tract infections at a rate of 23%. Um, other complications were wrist and digit stiffness, uh, loss of reduction or malreduction. In Wild's study, he found that the non-union rate uh, in these type of fractures using X-fixes was 62.5%, and this was a study that looked at 16 patients, and 10 of those 16 went on to a non-union. In Camp's study, he found that the longer you place the external fixator on, and in their study, the length went up to eight months, um, then the more likely these patients had decreased function and decreased motion. Um, also, if you have over-distraction of the carpus, this can lead to complex regional pain syndrome and stiffness of the digits. Um, external fixator, when it's used for these fractures, usually it is placed in a bridging or spanning manner, crossing the radiocarpal joint. And if you do a non-bridging uh, type of placement, uh, it's really going to be hard to get a pin in, around the articular surface and subchondral bone. So that's why when you place these, it's gonna be spanning the radiocarpal joint. You place two pins in the metacarpal, and when you do the two pins in the radial shaft, you wanna do an open approach to make sure you're looking, finding, and protecting the radial sensory nerve. And again, your reduction is indirect through traction. So currently with our technology, uh, the most common way to treat these is a long volar locking plate. When you have to put a, uh, these long plates on that extend proximally into the diaphysis, these plates are built in uh, with an anatomic radial bow, so that can help your reduction. Um, other treatment methods are the use of temporary uh, or supplemental spanning fixation. Um, Again, the external fixator or the internal bridge spanning plate. Um, and you can use bone grafts or bone substitutes to supplement your fixation as needed. So like I mentioned, the volar locking plate, this is how we most commonly fix these fractures now. Uh, benefits are you are bridging the comminuted metadiaphyseal area. So you theoretically are not disrupting the blood supply of these fracture fragments. Uh, the distal locking screws, they provide subchondral support, uh, supporting the articular surface, and your proximal fixation, it stabilizes the shaft of the fracture. Um, in the end, this can lead to better reduction of your articular surface, maintaining the volar tilt, inclination, the radial height, and your ulnar variance, and it can lead to earlier motion. Um, you can let these patients move their wrist joint sooner. Complications of placing the volar locking plates. Um, Matulo's study, he did a retrospective review on 21 fractures, treating all these uh, fractures with the long volar locking plate. For these patients, or 19% did go on to a non-union. All of those patients required secondary procedures of bone grafting, which in the end did heal. Uh, he had one case of a deep infection, and he had one case of post-operative carpal tunnel syndrome. Volar locking plates, if you place the distal locking screws too long and if they protrude the dorsal cortex, this can lead to irritation or rupture of the extensor tendons. And if you place these plates um, distal to the watershed line, then you can irritate or rupture the flexor pollicis longus tendon. 
Again, other risks involve complex regional pain syndrome, injury to the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve, uh, stiffness, and loss of fixation. Uh, so for this patient, this is a 54-year-old female. She had a motor vehicle accident. She had a closed uh, fracture that you see here. And in this situation, uh, we decided to fix it with a long volar locking plate. Uh, and we also used some interfragmentary screws to fix the fracture line that was in the sagittal plane. For spanning fixation, um, like I mentioned, you can do this uh, temporarily. It can be supplemental to a volar locking plate, or again, you can use it as your definitive treatment. Um, the benefits of this is you're letting your soft tissues cool down, um, let the swelling go down, you can let them improve. Um, also, this can lead to the fracture fragments uh, consolidating. Um, if you are going to switch it out to definitive fixation of internal fixation, um, most people will switch it out by about six to eight weeks post-op time. Um, however, if I'm using a temporary X-Fix, I personally like to try and fix try and switch it out as soon as possible, as soon as the soft tissues allow, um, usually around three, four weeks. Um, and that's because you'll have better mobility of the fracture fragments to get your reduction, as well as to decrease the chance of getting pin tract infection or irritation. Um, complications of an internal bridge or spanning plate, they are similar to an external fixator, and you do have to do a secondary procedure to remove this plate, usually at around four months post-op time, so you can let the patient start moving their wrist joint. This patient was a 27-year-old male. He had a gunshot wound uh, times two to the forearm. Um, initially, when we saw this patient, he had significant soft tissue swelling. He also had a soft tissue defect. So initially, he went for an irrigation and debridement. He was placed in a spanning external fixator. He had a wound vac placed on the wound, which later, once his swelling decreased, went on to uh, have a secondary closure of the wound. And his soft tissues were ready for definitive fixation at around three weeks post-op time. So that's when we removed the external fixator and went on to de definitive fixation of a long volar locking plate. Uh, this is a 35-year-old female. She was in a motor vehicle accident. The uh, airbag deployed onto her uh, wrist, and she had an extremely comminuted articular surface. It was pretty much dusted with extension in the metadaphyseal area. Um, in this situation, we did a volar locking plate, but uh, to help neutralize the articular surface, we also supplemented it with a spanning external fixator. The external fixator was then removed at four weeks post-op time, so we then let, it, let her start moving the wrist joint once it was removed. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, surgeon preference, you can use bone graft or bone substitutes um, to help uh, stabilize your reduction. Um, this is usually placed in the, in the metaphyseal area to help support your articular surface. Um, most commonly for autograft, the iliac crest bone graft is what um, is used. Allograft options, you can use cancellous chips to pack that down in your metaphyseal void. Um, bone substitute options consist of hydroxyapatite, calcium phosphate, calcium sulfate, and BMPs. And uh, there is inconclusive evidence if these bone grafts or bone substitutes um, do have a significant benefit as an adjunct uh, to these type of fractures. Thank you.